Well, I start, uh, every time I start a show, I start as if I'd never made a show before, and um, absolutely from nothing. Now, it doesn't appear that way at this time, but it did appear that way last summer, and it's very frightening, and uh, uh, I don't know if this is good or bad, whether this just means that you repeat your mistakes, or whether this is uh, a very good way of, of uh, uh, saving your innocence, because uh, it is very important to be innocent, I think, to approach to approach a show uh, without really knowing what's going to happen. And just to have the confidence that it will happen, things too, I, I think it's terrifying to do it this way, but uh, it's always a great pleasure if it works. And it hasn't failed entirely so far. There have been some things that have been disappointing, some things I haven't been able to bring off, but on the whole, uh, I've, I've met my uh, obligations or my deadlines. But what I, when I develop a show, Everything usually hangs together. That's uh, that is after after a while, the the um, uh, uh, one form sort of leads to another form, and there's a kind of consistency in the forms. There are maybe two or three forms that dominate the show, in different um, in different guises. So there's a kind of consistency in form, and you could say almost that every show uh, has a th uh, has has two or three themes and variations on the themes. It, I find it helpful to work that way. There's, a, I think, a, I, I strive for a consistency, which is something that's almost never noticed in a, by a reviewer. It's noticed, I suppose, by people who see the show, but no one ever mentions that the show as itself is a composition. Klaus Oldenburg is one of those artists for whose work the pace and texture of urban life are necessary conditions. Born in Stockholm, he grew up in Chicago, where his father was formerly the Swedish consul. It's hard to think of another artist who is more American in his outlook and in his perception of the details of contemporary life. Oldenburg came to New York in the late 50s. Now he and his wife, Pat, live and work in an immense loft on the Lower East Side. Along with several others, Oldenburg was one of the first to explore the vein in contemporary art, which later was to be called pop and he was one of the originators of the new kind of artist theater called Happenings. In this film, we see him working and preparing for a major exhibition of his new work. Last summer, um, I uh, went through about two months of what you might call uh, inspiring myself or priming myself by uh, reading and buying uh, hundreds of magazines and walking the streets of New York and, and uh, uh, I even, I took off 40 pounds, I gave up smoking. I, uh, I did all kinds of things to myself to, to, to get myself uh, stimulated or started in, in some direction. And um, uh, then I, I went through my notes, which is always a good stimulation, the, the notes from the past. There are many pieces that I've been intending to make, but I never get around to making and so on. And finally, uh, I sat down, or as I wouldn't say finally, let's say as a beginning, I sat down and made a list of about 50 things I would like to make. Uh, just uh, what came into my mind as a result of this, uh, this self-priming. But um, gradually, as I go along, the list gets shorter. I knock out things that don't seem to be particularly important, or that can be saved for later, or that seem just plain silly. And um, the list gets shorter and shorter and shorter and uh, more and more realistic. Everything progresses from the wildest dreams to uh, what can actually be done. And it's surprising how little one can do, really, you know, when you get right down to it. But it's, it's enough. I found that I had more than enough for this show. And I have, as a residue from, from uh, thinking about all the things I could do, I have maybe a uh, hundred ideas here for future shows, which I, I don't know if I'll ever get around to. Um, it accumulates. There's an awful lot of paper lying around the studio, an awful lot of sketches that uh, will never be realized. But, you know, all, it's all, all you care about is that there should be, maybe out of all of this stuff, maybe there should be uh, uh, 50 good ideas, because you can really work a lifetime on one good idea. I write every day, and um, uh, I feel... Um, uh, very unsure about what I write. And as a matter of fact, I have a suspicion that I write them to get them out of my system. I, some of them are, are certainly uh, an honest attempt to explain what I'm doing to myself. 
But many of them are very uh, frivolous and, and nasty. There's not a lot of nasty remarks in it. Uh, really, they're kind of uh, uh, a way of getting the stuff out of my system. So they don't serve as uh, a guide to my work necessarily. They're quite tricky that way. And I think they're also rather badly written. But it's a compulsive thing. Uh, the need to touch the typewriter and to, uh, to make the words appear on the white page. Uh, it's something, um, among other things, which makes the day go by. I think it's very hard to be an artist because there's nothing going on in your life. Uh, I mean, un unless you're working with something monumental like carving marble, uh, your day goes by and you, you have to find all kinds of different ways to engage uh, 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 your senses, you know, your, your something with the hands or... or uh, I mean, I read about poets constantly drinking tea and so on. And um, you have to, because um, I work all day long. I don't stop for lunch or anything like that. I just get up in the morning and I, I um, wander around my studio uh, all day long and then sometimes uh, half the night, you know, until something happens. So typing is a way of relieving the, uh, the boredom of the studio. Sometimes some rather nice things come out. And I try, so I try after a show to go through the material and select out what, um, what seems valuable and true. But I'm a very poor critic of my own writing. And I, I, I really don't want to be a writer. I, I feel I'm much more honest in expressing myself through plastic form. I, um, I should have started becoming an artist much sooner because I was always very interested in art and drawing. But uh, as it turned out, I didn't um, become uh, professionally involved with art until after I had been to college and after I'd worked a year and a half after college uh, in, uh, as, as a, uh, an apprentice newspaper reporter, uh, which seemed like a, um, a dead end. And I, I, I then um, took the leap into art, and into full-time studying art. But I studied mostly on my own. I didn't, uh, I had already gone to college, so I didn't feel like going through that again. So, uh, uh, more or less, I worked out the problems myself. I did go to a few classes and met some people, some other artists, and uh, talked about the problems of being an artist. But it was really what I did, what I've done has been a uh, result of uh, my own analysis of what, uh, um, what I think uh, the thing called art is. It's mainly been through uh, uh, going into myself and finding uh, uh, what, um, I mean, rooting expression in, in my own daily life or my perception of nature and, and uh, uh, a process over a number of years of sort of digging into myself and finding the form for what I, what I discovered in myself. In the work of Klaus Oldenburg, the inanimate objects in the world around us assume an almost terrifying intensity and vitality. Enormously enlarged in size, expressively exaggerated in texture, and brilliantly colored with shiny paint, his art is a kind of unprecedented sculpture to which he brings the sensibility of a painter and the passion of someone who loves sensation. Oldenburg's early pieces were mostly about food. He made pies beyond the glutton's wildest dreams, ice cream to tempt the oldest child, hamburgers as big as tents. At first, these objects were all made of plaster and painted with enamel. Later, as the scale became even larger, Oldenburg worked out a technique of sewing the pieces in cloth and stuffing them. His interest in the most immediate and direct experience of familiar objects eventually led him from food to clothing and ordinary household things. Oldenburg gave to objects a new personality. Particularly in the softness of the later sewn pieces, we begin to feel a sinuosity, sometimes indolent, sometimes threatening, sometimes sexual, which breaks down our accustomed assurance at the distinction between animate and inanimate. Occasionally, Oldenburg has turned to other materials like wood and plastic. One of his most extraordinary ventures was the furniture ensemble called Bedroom, like the rest of his work, larger than life. Uh, the, um, the bedroom is one of the rooms of the, of the house, and uh, it's the first room that I, uh, I, I tried, the second one being the bathroom. And um, I suppose we wanted to start with the, um, the rooms where there was most uh, um, physical contact or, or sensuousness. 
But many people have interpreted this as a, uh, as a funereal bedroom or as an anti-sensuous bedroom or as the death of sensuousness. And um, there must be that element in it too. There is a kind of, uh, uh, of um, formality about the bedroom which is frightening, especially the geometric forms. Um, so, uh, as in most of my work, there, is a, there are two contradictory uh, interpretations and impulses, and, and you have to make up your mind which one you want to follow, or you can follow one a little bit and then come back on the other one. So it's very hard to sum it up and to say it's any one thing. I like to look at this room. I like to pass it. It's kind of an oasis in the loft. Uh, in here, uh, things don't uh, uh, change. You know, outside, everything is flying around. And in here, protected by this plastic, uh, there's a kind of um, like an aquarium atmosphere. Then I got involved also with the automobile. I don't exactly know why I got involved with the automobile, but this was a new theme, and there probably are some very deep reasons that I don't, can't put my hands on at the moment, why? And then uh, suddenly the airflow floated into view and, and everything came together in, in that area. By a curious coincidence, it happened that the Airflow Chrysler, an advanced car of the 30s, wholly appropriate in its forms to the spirit of his work, was conceived by the father of Oldenburg's friend, the sculptor and filmmaker, Robert Breer. Oldenburg photographed and sketched a restored airflow owned by Mr. Breer. It's kind of, um, it's like an exploded view, and it's all types of pieces, or kinds of pieces of the car, uh, of different size models, and different type models also within the airflow uh, scheme. And each, um, each part is, is, um, is treated differently. Uh, there's some are on the floor, and some are hung from the ceiling, and some lie in the corner. And we expect, uh, we expect to keep making these parts and to work on this thing for uh, a rather long period of time. It's like composing a symphony uh, compared to a, a shorter piece. And um, it's, it's quite a job. It may be too much for us. But uh, even if we don't complete it, we still will have a lot of stuff if we work on, on the idea for about another year. And we're going to have another show um, next year in which the airflow idea will dominate, uh, just as the bathroom dominated the show uh, this year. And uh, I expect uh, many things to come out of it. There, there's quite a lot of freedom and quite a lot of possibilities. You could make many different models. I, I, I'm right now working with six models and, and uh, six uh, sizes, uh, of which one is a full scale. In a sense, Oldenburg's loft is a factory where he works out the problems of handling new materials in new ways with the help of his wife, Pat, and other assistants. Now, working with uh, soft sculpture, uh, using the canvas or the vinyl, uh, we're working with a medium that's uh, uh, very exploratory. And there are other ways to join the parts, uh, for example, heat sealing, but I think sewing is, uh, is uh, more involving and um, complex and, and, and therefore more satisfying. It's also, um, sewing is very much like drawing. And also, uh, this is like a translation of, of flat into round. As I make a pattern and then I give it, uh, we trace it and she, uh, uh, sews it together so that then it turns into a, a round or sculptural object. I, I get a great deal of pleasure out of involving other people in my work. And this is particularly uh, strong in Pat's case. And her sewing is also uh, is something very special. It's very aesthetic. Uh, and uh, the pieces uh, on which she works on become very much a collaboration pieces. Oldenburg explores the formal problems raised in these objects by first making corrugated cardboard models and then developing patterns for the shapes to be sewn. Well, it's necessary. It is necessary if you have set your mind to making something out of vinyl, it's necessary to make a very clear pattern. 
uh, to be followed in the sewing. So I started using cardboard, and I, uh, I keep using it and cut it very easily. And if I have an idea, I can very quickly make a model out of it through cardboard. And that's followed by um, taking the pattern and making it into canvas. And if that works, that's followed by a vinyl. I think, though, that the, the models have a kind of directness, which uh, um, people appreciate. I mean, the models, you know, I, I exhibit the models. The canvas pieces, uh, they, um, they originally served a function uh, of uh, working out the sewing uh, problem, but then they seem to be uh, something in themselves, very different from the vinyl pieces. For example, they seemed uh, uh, proletarian in relation to the vinyl pieces, or they seemed austere, or they seemed uh, more spiritual, less sensuous, um, or they seemed, well, I call them ghosts because they, I painted them white, and they see they're, they, they, had, they had a kind of a, a double uh, uh, existence, like the, the, um, the thought behind, you know, like the, the platonic idea uh, behind the, the sensuous uh, actuality. So uh, there are many people who prefer the canvas pieces to the vinyl pieces for one reason or another. And usually the canvas pieces are sold uh, for less. So there are all kinds of, uh, I'd, you know, you could work up all kinds of feelings about one as opposed to the other. Oldenburg's art often utilizes humor and untrammeled fantasy. Some of the best examples of these attributes are his drawings of schemes for monuments to be built in New York City. Uh, look, what, look at these, uh, I mean, there's no such thing as, a, as, a, as an honest monument. I don't know of any. If I say put a hot dog on Ellis Island, which I proposed, a giant frankfurter, then um, it's only because a giant frankfurter is one of uh, my personal objects, and I feel that in that position, in relation to the bay, it would be uh, very well located. So, um, see, that would be a very good instance of how you could get in trouble by bringing the two worlds together, the world of art and the world of the people outside. A monument gets you into trouble right away. If I just made my things and called them art, and, and, uh, but that's because I was, uh, I, I was brought up uh, to believe that um, uh, one should try to reach people and one should try to sum, uh, to sum up what people are feeling and. Uh, one should try to make people all into one, and so on. And even though I know it doesn't work, I keep doing it. The bathroom is the second room of the home, which I started doing uh, uh, a couple of years ago. I started with the bedroom, and uh, now it's time for the bathroom. The, uh, that is tied in with the idea that um, the, um, the home is full of sculpture-like objects, um, such as uh, the sink, or the toilet, or the tub, or the appliances that you use, the toaster, the uh, orange squeezer, and the can opener, uh, objects that are um, sculptural in concept. They stand in space. Uh, it's also... Um, the, um, the fact of, of porcelain or enamel, that it looks so much like uh, a patent vinyl. And uh, it's possible to make something out of vinyl that looks like soft porcelain. Uh, that had a lot to do with this choice. But it's, it's really to uh, develop the theme of the home. The next step would be the living room. And uh, I've already dealt with parts of the kitchen, but I might uh, deal with an entire kitchen using a stove and um, maybe a washing machine or a dryer, something like that. I prefer a, a material and a subject that suggests change and flow, which is, for example, why I choose uh, ice cream and uh, the representation of ice cream in plaster. And uh, here I am uh, using a soft cloth, soft vinyl fabric, um, to suggest the possibilities of change uh, in relation to an object 
That is, in the soft version of the sink, it's possible to see the sink from above and from beside and from the front at the same time, because the front of it falls down in the soft version. And also, there are changes in meaning, uh, or changes in subject matter and changes in, in image that happen as a result of the softness. The, uh, what is um, identifiable as a sink uh, takes all kinds of different uh, forms and can be identified in many different ways if the material is changed into soft material. The whole thing is that I, I start, I say this is a sink, and uh, from there, it can be uh, almost anything, depending on who's looking at it. You can always go back and say it's a sink, that it's defined as a sink. But uh, I wouldn't want to set any limits to where the, uh, um, the image can go after that. People will see their own images or whatever they want to see. In general, my approach is to set a limit a general limit, and within that limit, let things have a life of their own, take their own form. And that's what happens with the cloth, and that's what happens when I do a, uh, a performance, a happening. I set uh, very general limits uh, within which people develop themselves in relation to the objects that I give them. I, d I don't know why the toilet should be offensive to people as a subject. It. Um, it has never hit me that way at all. That is, I'm not cho I've not chosen a subject that uh, deliberately to shock anybody. Uh, I've just assumed that that's one of the sculptures of the home. And um, it's such an important and, and obvious part of the home that uh, I just have accepted it. It's a highly idealized uh, version of a, uh, of a common toilet. It's also magnified in scale. It's placed up on a pedestal. And everything is done to make it, uh, to emphasize its uh, its existence as a sculpture object, to, to remove the, uh, uh, the association, I think, to, to, to make you see the thing as itself. But as I say, there are many people who simply cannot see beyond subject matter. Uh, my work is always having this trouble. It's a kind of a deliberate obstacle that I make for people, because I choose a, uh, a very simple uh, subject, which is usually very close to people's uh, experience. and. Um, that might give them the idea that they, they can dispose of the whole thing simply by referring to their experience. But uh, that's only the starting point. And uh, uh, it's, um, to say, it is an obstacle for many people. Uh, well, I was watching TV or um, sometimes reading the newspapers. And um, I see the uh, kind of uh, general public view reflected uh, general public view of what I'm doing. And um, it's very puzzling because uh, it, it's very different from uh, uh, what I think I'm doing and what a few people uh, know that I'm doing. So that, uh, uh, well, if I was, say, an artist who was removed from the objects of the world, who was, uh, uh, say, uh, say, I was an abstract artist, uh, then uh, perhaps this would be pretty consistent. I mean, this uh, uh, sense of being, uh, of finding the general op opinion strange. But because I deal with things that enter into everybody's lives, uh, it seems that they, uh, the general public, should also uh, see what I'm doing the way a few people see and the way I see. Of course, they don't, and uh, I, I have to accept that. The, uh, the, the problem is that you have to, um, uh, in order to, to get an honest piece of work, you have to um, uh, follow your own uh, feelings. And uh, you can't uh, listen to other people uh, telling you what to do. Uh, if uh, at the same time you have a desire to uh, do things for other people, let's say a moral purpose in making your art, which I do, then um, it, it, might, it does get confusing. Now, I don't know of any way to make art other than following my own, my own feelings and notions. And, um, the, the fact that I do use subject matter uh, indicates that uh, uh, it's not just for myself. It's, uh, it's for other people to ponder or to be led into. And that's a kind of a traditional notion of art, is that if people can be fastened by the subject matter, they can be led into the deeper areas of the thing, which is really problems of form and balance and, and grace and order and, you know, the finer things of life. I mean, my thinking is very traditional along those lines. 
but uh, I find that uh, instead of uh, instead of having this work for me, I find that my uh, my uh, I'm stepping on all kinds of toes, and uh, uh, I'm not being taken seriously, and um, people are not uh, seeing what's there, and. Um, Perhaps they're being led away rather than led into, and I'm becoming more and more isolated rather than more and more at one with them. That's something that uh, I, I always hope over a period of time will change. But uh, I, in my heart, I know it really doesn't work, you know. But I keep trying. And, uh, however, I mean, I must say that, that there are a lot of people who love my work and they tell me so. And a lot of people who see it, perhaps, uh, you know, a comforting amount of people, I mean, more than I would expect, who see something in it and who like it. You call on Sarkhan, this is a wonderful show for us. Beautiful. Yeah, Bye. you are. <laughs> see you. Uh, she was going to sell a piano, but uh, I didn't give her the plan. I had no idea that it took so long to make plans. Like so many others who explore new ground, Oldenburg worries about the loneliness of his path, particularly because the flavor and intensity of his work disturb some sensibilities. The justification comes when his exhibition opens, when people arrive to see where his art has gone, to confirm his special, unique accomplishment. The openness and extravagant intensity of Oldenburg's objects mean more than pleasure for our senses. He, like some of his contemporaries, insists that we examine our familiar surroundings with a fresh eye, that we discover new ways of seeing and feeling, to enlarge the meaning and significance of everyday life. Art for Oldenburg can no longer be separated from life. He shares the optimism which has become a keynote of contemporary American art. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. I want to see what's going on. Uh, I made, uh, I haven't made, there's six, six possible models. Hey, you only have two little ones here. Yeah, the little ones. Then there's one bigger one, it's number two. And then the parts, the insides, come from other models, number five and number six. Well, is this big car, does it open up? Does it have an engine in it, or is it like No. It would be, well, it would be more the outside. What's the inside? This is the inside. Well, like the toilet opens up and you got inside. You don't right. open up the hood of the car and find no. the motor in it. You don't no, no. How come? Well, I don't know. I haven't solved that. It's, uh, it's very difficult to make a car. I mean, and then you don't even ask yourself, this is, you really want to make a car, you know, or you want to make, I mean, I'm just using the car as a subject, you know. I mean, it's not going to be a car. It, like, one may be split this way, the other may be split the other way. Yeah. I was surprised to see the engines. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network.